Stanford University. I'd just like to introduce a couple of people here in the audience. First, Bert Richter was the uh, chairman of our uh, nuclear power subcommittee of our report, and Jeff Byron here, when he was on the commissioner on the California Energy Commission, was one of the sponsors of, of this report. So um, thanks to you guys, uh, this, is, this is what it is. And I'm pleased to see you here today. So let's see if I can, I'll figure this out. OK, good. So as Sally mentioned, most people understand that we have AB 32, which is the, the uh, law in California that says we have to reduce emissions to 1990 levels by 2050. But Governor Schwarzenegger also signed an executive order saying that we should reduce our emissions to 80% below, uh, below 1990 levels by 2050. And we're one of three states in the union that have such a uh, law. The state of Massachusetts and the state of New York also have these uh, uh, mandates. Um, and pretty much uh, the EU is now considering a similar mandate. And pretty much uh, every, no one knows exactly how to do it. So one of the things we set out to do in this committee was to figure out uh, whether you could do it. What, what would the technology look like to actually get that done? It's a huge leap. It's going from 48, 480 million metric tons of carbon dioxide uh, today down to something like 80. And we really only have 40 years left to do it. So it's, it's or actually less than 40 years. So it's, a, uh, it's an enormous leap. We took the approach of just seeing if the technology was there. Is, it, is there an energy system that would meet our needs? So first thing is to, we had to do was define what our needs were and, uh, and, and meet these emission standards at the same time. We were not looking at economics. We were not looking strongly at other impacts. We did consider these things, but really we were just asking the question, is it feasible? Is it, is it is there any possibility of finding a technology that would do all of this, or set of technologies? This is the committee that was there. I don't want to dwell on this, but um, there were quite a few people here from Stanford, also Lynn Orr and uh, Jim Sweeney, John Wyatt participated, George Schultz lent us his name. Um, we felt like it was a, a very strong committee and came, uh, was, was quite, a, California quite unusual in the fact that we have so many institutions with such a strong background in, in energy research. So these, these people all contributed greatly. On the left is a list of, um, of people who were lead authors for the eventual uh, product that we produced. So the short answer is yes, you could do it, um, but boy, is it going to be hard. Um, we could get to about 60% of emission cuts with uh, technology that's largely around now. We know about it, it's either deployed or it's in demonstration. And we could figure out a bunch of ways to get the rest of it out. Uh, all these the ideas would be less well understood, uh, let farther from market, and perhaps uh, expensive in today's uh, realm. But you could do it. So the bottom line is you can. Uh, the limitations that we saw in the end, this is the, the messages we were going to get out, is that we don't have the technologies for load balancing that we need without emissions. We don't uh, have an acceptable uh, solution for base load, and without that, the first problem becomes worse. That we're not, we haven't found a really good, uh, uh, if, we, if we move away from doing all renewables to, to uh, trying to accept the fact that we need some base load, we have choices that people don't like. And Probably the most important of all of these, we really don't have all the technology we need for mobile, sort, mobile uses of fuel. So the, the last one is the one that is probably the largest technology hole in the whole energy system <coughs> is going to be fuel. So we have biofuels coming down the pike. We simply will not have enough biomass to meet all the needs for mobile fuel. And we don't have another good technology coming down the pike. So those are the major things. So I said we did this as an existence proof. And so we did it with logic. We said if you're not going to have emissions, you can't burn fossil fuel. And if you're not going to burn fossil fuel, there's only four things you can do. Actually, there's five. The first one is admit that you're an addict. And the, second, the next four are one is to say, how much can we control emissions just by making things more efficient? The second rule, the second uh, step is to say, OK, I can do better with getting emissions out of the electricity system than mobile sources, so I'm going to electrify everything I possibly can. 
And now that's the demand side, and then you shift to the supply side and say, okay, now I have to provide a lot of electricity. How can I do it without emissions? And I still have to provide some fuel because I haven't been able to electrify everything. And so how do I provide that fuel without emissions? So those are the four steps. And we have a little cartoon that shows them that I like a lot. I still have a t-shirt project in mind, but I haven't gotten there yet. So the bottom is the way in which we get energy either from electricity or fuels. And the y-axis is the greenhouse gas intensity. So the area of the box is just our carbon footprint of the energy system. And what we're going to do is use less. So we're going to squeeze the box in from both sides. And then we're going to shift it to electricity. And then we're going to find sources that have less emissions per unit energy. And so we're going to shrink the carbon footprint of the energy system. So these are the four steps in getting there. Remember the fifth one, though, first you have to admit you're an addict. So this is the sum of it. Is this, is the, this is the process we went through. And then we went through a bottom-up study of each of those four steps. How much efficiency could we get? How much electrification should we, could we get? Where could we get our electricity without emissions? And where could we get our fuel without emissions? Okay, so it's a very simple story out of a very complex system, which is, I think, one of the major contributions of this report, in my view, is the simplification of this process to these four important steps. So when we did this bottom-up study, then we binned the technology we invoked. And we looked at all these energy technologies. And we only tried to use, whoops, that's the wrong one. We only tried to use bin one and bin two. A couple of places we, we get into bin three. But we said, we want to just use stuff we know about. How far can we get with things we know about, with technologies that are deployed now? You can buy them or technologies that are at least demonstrated. A couple of places we had to pick things that were in development. So we started from the bottom-up process. We said, how do you do this efficiency and electrification? And we looked at three sectors, buildings, industry, and transportation. So this is just a couple of example plots to show you how far you get. Here are all the buildings that we go, that we have, I'm oh, sorry keep pressing the wrong one here, that we go from today, 2010, to 2050, and all the building stock is either going to be new or retrofit. There will be no buildings in 2050 that are here today that haven't been touched. Every square foot of building has to be either retrofit, torn down, or new. This is very dramatic. This gives you a very strong feeling for what kind of efficiency we're pulling in here. These are all efficiency standards so that buildings use something like 70 or 80 percent less energy than they use today. We also did the same thing with transportation and with industry. I'm not going to show you the graphs for all of these. These are just examples. But this would be the light duty uh, fleet, which we've made more efficient. Now, one of the things I want to point out here is people who generally study transportation and look at the energy used in transportation like to look at three things. They like to look at the vehicle miles traveled, they like to look at the fuel, and they like to look at the efficiency of the vehicles. And they multiply all three of those things together to tell you how efficiency would work, how energy would work in the transportation system. This study is different. This study took apart the fuel problem, the behavior problem, and the efficiency problem so that when transportation wanted to rely on low carbon sources of biofuel, but electricity wanted those same sources, we could be sure to only count it once. So this is only vehicle efficiency. This is not vehicle miles traveled, which is a behavior problem. And it is not the decarbonization of the fuel, which we treated as a fuel problem. This is just the efficiency part. So what you see here is that the fleet gradually changes over from one that is a conventional gasoline fleet to one that is dominated by electricity, either in hybrids or in completely electric cars. And the uh, average fuel efficiency goes from something around uh, 20, 25 miles per gallon up to something like 75, with the maximum being close to 90. This is, again, is a very fast rollover rate of vehicles on the road and, and is, is based pretty much on what historical maximums could be in rolling over the fleet. When we do all of this efficiency, 
we find that we use uh, a lot less electricity and a lot less fuel. So we use 31% less electricity because of all these efficiency measures. Oops, I kind of pressed the wrong one again. 31% less electricity and 52% fuel. But we have, this is zero here because in fact, in the next slide, we have electrified all of the buses and rails. We haven't done anything to airplanes on electrification, but we have made them 50% more efficient. So all the bus and rail is electrified. Every, all the vehicles have been made more efficient. And as a result of that, the electrification, we're now increasing the amount of electricity that we are going to use by 56% and decreasing the amount of fuel. So what we've essentially done is say, hey, if we didn't do anything, we're going to need about twice as much electricity in 2050 as we need now. We'll use roughly half of that by making things more efficient, but then we'll increase it back up to where it was before because we're going to electrify as much as we possibly can. So we essentially end up with that is just using less fossil fuel, which is really burning less fossil fuel, which is the trick. These are just some uh, graphs that I'm just going to show very briefly. These are the technology bins. These are the technologies that were invoked that are highlighted in yellow to do these efficiency measures in buildings. And my point really is to, to just show you this, is that there are all technologies we know about. We know how to do this. This is not something that is a mystery. And we have a few of these for industry. In a couple of cases, we felt industry would delve into some technologies that were not currently in demonstration, but they would prove to be implemented by 2050, so we invoke them. There is no, here's for transportation, again, only invoking technology we know about. So here are the bottom line numbers. Today we use about 270 terawatt hours per year. If we did nothing, we'd slightly less than double that to 470 by, um, Doing the efficiency plus electrification, we increase that number slightly to 510. But it's more or less doubling electricity and decarbonizing it at the same time. Fuel, on the other hand, goes from 36 billion gallons of gasoline equivalent per year down uh, and would, would almost double if we didn't do anything and we cut it uh, by about two thirds, by about a third. So now we have to figure out how we're going to get that electricity and how we're going to get that fuel. And so we look at doubling the electricity. So we're essentially rebuilding the entire electricity system that we have today twice over and decarbonizing at the same time. So how are you going to do that? There are probably there are three ways to do it. You can do it with nuclear power, which Bert uh, Richter was great at figuring out whether we could do that. We could do it with fossil, by burning fossil fuels and sequestering the emissions. And we could do it with renewable energy. Well, these are not all very equivalent because nuclear power, for example, has a very high capacity factor. So we would only have to build four, oops, 44 gigawatts of nuclear power, whereas renewable energy has a low capacity factor. Capacity factor is how, what percentage of the time a plant is actually operating at its nameplate value. So because the wind isn't blowing all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time, in California we're kind of lucky that capacity factors are as high as 30%. In Pennsylvania they're like 15 or 20% for wind power. So because of this 70% intermittent portfolio, we have some uh, hydropower, some uh, uh, geothermal energy, which has a high capacity factor, we have to build 160 gigawatts of capacity um, to, to get the same thing we would get with 44 gigawatts of nuclear power if we did it that way. So um, let's see, and just to uh, make it clear, all three of these scenarios that we looked at assume that 33% of our portfolio would be from renewables because that's also the law in California. So they all have 33% renewables. This one is almost all in the renewables. So, so the first uh, difference is how much capacity uh, that we have. And then the second difference is how much we have to uh, balance the load with 
some other form. So all, all of these forms of electricity require some load balancing factor. They have to meet the load uh, instantaneously at all times. So you have ramping load, you have peak loads, and in the case of the intermittents, you have perhaps as much as gigawatt days where the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing and you have to provide some kind of storage. So that means that some of this portfolio, we assumed, would be handled in some way by storage. And we made an assumption here that about half of it would be, uh, be uh, taken care of by natural gas. So in the case of renewables, we're seeing about twice as much natural gas needs to be used to balance the load. And I'll, I'll say more about that later. So what about the nuclear energy portfolio? This one, we found no technical reasons for not doing nuclear power. Um, there were, we could, the build rate is about one power plant uh, per year um, through from 2020, say, to 2050, which is historically possible. There is adequate land for doing this. Uh, there is uh, plenty of uh, cooling capacity. We can do passive cooling. We don't have to use water. We can use air cooling with a, some loss of efficiency, but you can do it. We felt that the costs would not be a huge barrier over time if we started to build nuclear power plants, that they would become less expensive. Um, but we see major barriers to getting this done. One is that new nuclear power is against the law in California until the nuclear waste uh, uh, repository is licensed by the federal government, that there's a lot of public concern about it, especially post Fukushima. And so, there's, but the challenges are all pretty much institutional. They're not technical. For coal, our, our gas was CCS. There's a little difference here between the other two forms in the fact that they're not completely emission free, that you can only capture 90% roughly of the uh, emissions and sequester them. So this actually has some amount of emissions we have to take into account. Uh, California is blessed with a lot of capacity for storing CO2, but the, uh, certainly the new oil and the old oil and gas abandoned reservoirs would be the best place to look to put them because we understand these very well. They've been characterized in order to take the oil and gas out, and that we probably could get to the rest of the century that way, with through the rest of the century that way, with uh, uh, by doing 60% of our electricity with with natural gas. So this seemed to be a doable solution, but it's more or less in demonstration or beginning to be in demonstration, and major full-scale plants are still uh, to be built. Finally, we looked at renewable energy, and California is a really remarkable state because even though we have to build three times the capacity that we would have to build with nuclear power, we still have enough renewable energy to do this. So all of these sources are available. We have wind power, we have solar, we have geothermal. We have the largest geothermal plant in the world here in, in California. And so there's plenty of, of this <coughs> renewable energy around. It just turns out that the intermittency problem is the big problem here. How do you handle that intermittency? So this is a comparison. I'll, I won't uh, dwell on this if you want to get the slides that are on the web. And I'll just tell you, this is there. This tells you, compares the build rates and whatnot for all of these different forms. So the load balancing problem. This, we decided, had to be taken care of. We had to account for this. It's usually not accounted for because people don't, uh, people just look at the capacity problem. But if you're going to really build out renewable energy or even if you're going to build out uh, base load power, you still have to provide this load balancing where you meet the peak you take care of the ramping, and, you, and in the case of intermittency, you take care of when the plants are not running. So there are only three different ways to do this that we know about. One is you can use natural gas, which is what's happening now. If you look in the state of California, we have a 33% renewable portfolio standard. And what's more or less happening is natural gas companies are coming in and saying, wait, this is great. We need to sell a lot of natural gas to firm the power. So that's the sure way to do it. But natural gas in this form uh, is very difficult to, to operate CCS, carbon capture and storage, with, with natural gas that's being used in a load firming way. It's not, not even being thought of, really. So you're going to have emissions. If you don't do that, then you, have, you could try storing the energy. But the battery technology, I heard uh, Bill Gates, I think it was, it said that if you 
add up all the batteries in the United States today, you would get out of that 10 minutes worth of electric generation for the whole country. So the battery storage capacity is not there, anywhere near what it needs to be um, for this level problem. And particularly if you look at wind records in the, in the state of California, you'll find whole weeks when the wind doesn't blow. Um, we don't think that the technology is there yet to solve this problem. One interesting idea is to use all of hydropower to store, um, to de dedicate all of your hydropower to firming wind power. And that, that idea is being looked at. Difficulty there, of course, is that the uh, efficiency of running these turbines in a load-following manner goes down fairly dramatically. So uh, energy storage, the technology we felt was a whole. It's not there. The last approach to this is to use uh, what we called load-following or flexible loads or what people commonly call the smart grid. And here we felt that um, the understanding of that, that this, this is good in theory, that it's a smart idea, we should do it, um, but that the amount of effort it was going to take and the implications of, of actually implementing this were, um, were very far away. So for example, in the state of California, uh, over the past few years, PG&E uh, tried to implement smart meters on people's homes. And uh, three things happened. One, it was done against their will. Two, their bills went up. And three, they get, became concerned that they were being exposed to radiation. So the three kind of worst things you can think of for a public relations program, there was a huge pushback on just getting the smart meters put on people's homes. We're not talking about smart meters. We're talking about changing the whole industry. It's not just smart meters to one that's sort of akin to um, the change in the telephone system from having Ma Bell run the whole thing to having a distributed system where everybody can barter and buy power according to who has it and how much they're willing to sell it. That change in the, in the entire industry is enormous. And it may happen. It would be wonderful if it did. But it's a lot to bet on if you're going to put all your bets on renewable energy and bet on the smart grid to solve it. You have a pretty huge barrier to get over to make that all work. So, and our experience so far hasn't been very good when even just putting the smart meters on, the, on people's houses was a tremendous uh, difficult problem. So we think, uh, and there's another uh, data point here which I think is kind of interesting, is Cisco has estimated that the number of devices that would be managed by computers to do a fully uh, implemented smart grid exceeds the size of the World Wide Web. This is, this is not something that's, of course, that's, their, that's a business calculation. Uh, you don't have to have all of those devices managed to have some degree of smart grid. But a fully implemented smart grid would be bigger than the World Wide Web. So these are not, these are not small changes that would have to happen if you're, gonna ha if you're going to handle a high degree of, of intermittency. And even if you have that, if you have it fully implemented, it's not really well understood how much of the intermittency problem it would handle. Just to give you an idea why it's important, we were able to estimate the amount of storage that would be required, or the amount of natural gas, if you like, that would be required to firm the loads, or to fo follow, uh, follow loads, in a case where we did 60% 60, 60 nuclear, 60% natural gas with CCS or coal with CCS, or we did all renewables. And on the left, you see the dark blue line is how much the emissions of the whole energy system would be if we firmed all that power with natural gas. And on the right, if you, if you somehow solve the intermittency problem and have no emissions. And what you see here is for the renewable energy portfolio that the difference between solving the intermittency problem and not solving it, in other words, firming all the power of natural gas, that that is just about the same order of magnitude as the target emissions for the entire energy system. So just by load balancing with natural gas, if you built out renewable energy as a, as a way to manage all of your electricity, you would exceed the target for the whole uh, energy system. So we think it's an important problem and it ought to be treated like an energy sector with its own emissions and its own accounting. So uh, this is a summary. I think I went through all that, so I'll skip it. So the summary uh, for electricity is that um, 
If we went with nuclear, we would have the fewest number of plants. We have problems with public policy, public acceptance, um, but the, it's a slam dunk from a technical perspective. Fossil with CCS, it's similar. We have to build out a little bit more because of the parasitic load of having to capture the CO2 and put it underground. Uh, and you don't get all the emissions. And renewables have a much, have a much larger uh, problem with load balancing that we have to solve. So we've done that. And now we say, we ask, I think the important question that we have to ask is, are we going to have base load or not? And if we're not going, if we are going to have it, then you're going to have to do something about choosing between nuclear power and fossil with CCS, because these are the only base loads. Now that we do have the capacity for increasing geothermal energy, which is a great form of renewable energy because it is base load, but it's unlikely to be enough to solve this whole problem. We should maximize it, but we still are going to have to choose. If we want base load, we're going to have to choose between fossil with CCS and maybe not choose between them, maybe choose both of them and nuclear power. And if we say no, we don't want to have base load, then you really have to commit to solving this intermittency problem. And if, that, and if you don't commit, then what you're going to have is a, an unreliable electricity system. And so I think these are the choices that come out of this study. So again, uh, on these technologies, as we built up our portfolios, just to show you that we were using technologies that were uh, more especially in renewable energy, we could get all the renewable energy we needed with technology we know about. It's not a matter of getting a better solar cell. It's a better matter of dealing with what you're going to do when the sun isn't shining. Um, so the technologies for load balancing, we didn't go into any great detail. But basically, we, we made a wild ass guess that some of these would be uh, developed by 2050. And so from here on out in the study, we just made an assumption that half of this load balancing problem would be solved without emissions and half of it would be done with natural gas. And we just did that to move forward. This is an area that needs a lot more work. So in order to understand the fuel problem, we made an assumption that California would make the very wise decision to get about a third of their electricity from renewables, a third from nuclear power, and a third from fossil with CCS, that they would be balanced, and that about half of this load balancing problem would be handled with natural gas, and somehow the other half would be handled without emissions. Then we looked at the fuel problem. So when you add all this up, if you recall from my chart, you still needed 27 billion gallons of gasoline equivalent of fuel. You can electrify heavy duty transport. We don't have any electric airplanes. Um, you, can, you need some fuel, this gas that we mentioned for load following. And we also have some needs in industry for fuel where you can't really electrify the heat. So, the biofuels are pretty much the only thing that's in the pipeline right now, and so it comes down to estimating whether we have enough biomass. So we went through California's sources of possible biomass, restricting those sources to those that would not interfere with food. So it's all waste materials and crops that can be grown on marginal land without irrigation, without fertilizer. And when we did that, we looked at uh, these energy, some, uh, some of these energy crops on marginal lands, crop residues, municipal solid waste, animal waste, and municipal wastewater, and you add it all up. And there's a large range in the estimate of what you could get, somewhere between 41 and 121 uh, million dry tons a year, which translates into 3 to 10 billion gallons of gasoline equivalent of fuel. But some of that probably can't really be used for fuel because of where it's being produced and how it's, uh, what exactly it is. It would be better to burn it and make electricity. So only about 5.5 billion gallons makes sense. Now these estimates increase the state's es estimates uh, for fuel by a significant amount, but unfortunately I can't tell you how much. So they're very optimistic. They're very optimistic estimates. So well, that's not, we knew that's not enough. We're looking for 27 billion gallons. So we said, okay, well, you know, Brazil, the rest of the country, maybe we'll be able to import some. One of the rules that we had for our study was that if we tried to use resources to do what we were trying to do, reduce the emissions by 80%, that we had to assume that the rest of the world was doing that too. So this was a very controversial assumption. 
but I think it's, it's okay for now because it doesn't change the conclusion, which is that we just don't have enough. The biomass available to meet all of our fuel needs uh, is, is probably going to be around um, 13 billion gallons by this estimate, and we needed 27 billion gallons. The total demand is 37, but 10 of it would be used for natural gas, for gas-fired electricity generation with CCS, and so we don't have to count that. So the, only the 27 is what we're looking for, and we only can estimate, we can only get about half of that. So there's two problems with biofuels. One is where are you going to get the biomass, and the other is what's the carbon signature of that biofuel. So right now, the, with the E85, we see that the, um, uh, that the carbon signature on the left there, the y-axis, of these fuels is uh, certainly not zero. And actually, in some cases, people feel that it's greater, it's worse, than hydrocarbons. And so it's very unlikely that any E85 or ethanol scenario would contribute to this future of reducing emissions by 80%. On the other hand, these advanced biofuels that people are thinking about could reduce, um, could, could reduce the uh, carbon emissions by a significant amount more. And so we use these drop-in, we use estimates for drop-in fuels. And the thought was that in the direction that they're going now, we could expect that they would uh, get as much as 80% below fossil fuel by 2050. But, the problem is that the amount of biomass is actually much more important to the estimate than the actual signature, as long as it's below, significantly below fossil fuel in its emissions, it's more important how much biomass you have. And the reason for that is that every gallon of biofuel offsets the use of a gallon of, of fossil fuel. So you get a double whammy every time you use it. But so, it, so this graph just shows that if you uh, lower the carbon signature of the fuel, it helps, but it doesn't help as much as getting more biomass associated with biofuel. So here we are at the end of the story. The emissions that we have right now are uh, somewhat above 1990 levels, but in 2050 they're projected to almost double if we do nothing. So, one of the things we got asked all the time, well, what's, you know, people feel like, oh, well, we'll just be efficient. Or we'll just create a, a lot of electricity with, that doesn't have emissions. Or we'll just use biofuels. So what we did is we took each of our four steps and applied only that step, only low carbon fuels or only low carbon electricity to see how much we could reduce emissions. And if we do any one of these steps, we don't get anywhere near the target of 80% below 1990 levels. And in these graphs, the green represents the emissions from fuels, and the yellow represents emissions from electricity. But in fact, it's pretty much all fuel, because the yellow part is almost all load following, which is done with fuel. So this whole carbon signature that you get after doing each of these steps is from fuel. So we said, OK, how about if you did any two or any three, and then finally all four. And if you do all four, we end up almost twice the carbon, the, the uh, target amount of emissions. We are able to reduce emissions 60% below 1990 levels by doing all four targets, all four of these actions. But we still have the rest to get. So um, again, this, this uh, lays out what that 60% solution looks like. Uh, CCST.us, www.ccst.us has the report, and all of these uh, view graphs are on the, re on, the, on the website, and if you want to look in detail at what the portfolios are, you can look there. So now the next question is, what do you do to get the rest of the way? 60% below 1990 is not enough. enough. We want to go all the way 80% below. So we started looking at a variety of um, measures for doing that, and uh, here they are in order of effectiveness with some of them being ruled out because they're just not very good ideas. For example, doubling the biomass supply seems like it might not be a very good idea because if we've only picked that biomass 
which is available for, uh, which doesn't affect food. If we start uh, increasing that, it might not be a very good idea. Some of these ideas at the bottom of the, of the list, like fuel from sunlight, which is a major research project of Caltech and LBL. Uh, these are great ideas. That's the closest thing to a silver bullet that you could come to because silver, uh, remember all of that carbon signature was from fuel. If you're able to get all the fuel you want without a carbon signature, you have solved the whole problem. But these are probably very, very far away in terms of uh, ever uh, coming, to, uh, coming to market. So these in the middle seem to be things that were possible to bring into, um, into the market within the next 50 years. And by combining more than one of these, it would be possible to, to get, um, to get uh, down to the target. So I'll show you a few of those. One is that you solve the load balancing problem. Another is that you get the uh, biofuel down to zero uh, greenhouse gas signature. And then we were very careful in this whole study not to include behavior change, not to convolve it. But in the end, we said, OK, well, how about if you have behavior change? People don't use as much energy. They change their lifestyles. How much could we do there? And there we were just uh, didn't do very much on it because we had trouble finding good references for how much you could expect. And basically, um, uh, we were advised by Maxine Savage. And she said, 10% is about all she'd ever seen. And then we found one reference that said 10%. So this is another area which is really important because in most studies, people convolve the behavior change with efficiency. And so you don't know which is which. And I think this is this separating out how much we could actually achieve this way is really important. Um, finally, we looked at um, combinations of things, like the idea of using uh, BECs, bio, you burn biomass, and then you capture the emissions and you put it underground so you create a negative emission, a negative uh, credit for emissions, and then you can somehow develop the institutional capacity to trade that to people who want to continue to use fossil fuel. And those ideas are all, all really good. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will just show you uh, the plots here. The only one that actually fixes the problem is getting more biomass, but we we don't think it's a good idea to count on that because of the interaction with food. So because at the same time that we're going to double the amount of energy we need between now and 2050, we're also going to probably double the amount of food we need. So it just seems like a bad bet. But by each one of these things adds a little bit. And if we do more than one, we can get below the line. So the bottom line is that by Taking, and let me just say, these, these particular methods that we looked at was not an exhaustive search. It was not a, even a strategic search. It was just some of the ideas that people had on this committee. The idea of, of looking at what you do to get rid of that last carbon signature, which is all from fuel, is really the <coughs> challenge, the biggest challenge of the energy system, in my view. Now, you, you don't have to solve the load following problem if you've solved the fuel problem. If you've solved the fuel problem, you, you can use that fuel to balance the load. So the single most important uh, empty piece of technology or hole in the technology in energy is low carbon fuel. OK, I'm not going to talk about these, but I want to, um, OK, I, I think I just want to skip to the end here. There are a lot of details here on these. But um, so the three things that we need to work on, emission-free load balancing, acceptable emission base, uh, sorry, acceptable emission-free base load, and a non-biomass source of emission-free fuel. These are the three takeaways of this message. Now, I just wanted, the reason I wanted to skip to this is I want to talk a little bit about the world or the rest of the country. And you know, this is California, right? So how does, it, how does it differ? Well, in California, we don't burn very much coal at all. And pro probably 40% of our energy use is transportation. The rest of the country is like 25% is transportation. And they burn a lot of coal. So we don't know if these conclusions are robust in those other systems. But what we think is that the methodology we used for adding it up is robust. 
and that we ought to do that for other parts of the world. And just to get some kind of feeling for how it might change, the marginal emissions from balancing the load in California with natural gas are positive. Because if we have a lot of nuclear power, we have a lot of renewables, a lot of, uh, uh, and we put in CCS, and then you use natural gas to balance the load, that has more emissions than, than the base energy system. In Pennsylvania, where they're burning coal to make electricity, when they balance the load with natural gas, their marginal emissions are negative. So the, some of the conclusions that we've drawn here might be slightly different. Also, California is highly efficient now. Other parts of the country have more to gain from efficiency. So the changes in how we end up, uh, what ends up being important are likely in other parts of the world and other parts of the, of the um, uh, country. And I'd, li I'd just like to bring that up. Finally, I just want to reiterate that those of you who are interested, I met with a bunch of students today, those are people are very interested in building better solar cells, better renewable energy. Don't forget the, the uh, intermittency problem and make sure that you're solving that along with, with your passion for renewable energy because it's a whole system that has to be, has to be uh, maximized, not just one little piece. Thanks, I'll stop there and take questions. Yep. If we look to, uh, to Europe and how they're handling uh, increasing penetrations of uh, intermittent renewables, namely in Denmark and Germany, a lot of wind, they're using uh, international transmission and conventional and pump storage hydropower right. to do most of that, actually almost all of that load balancing. And I was yeah. wondering if you saw kind of the comparison here in the U.S. to potential for interstate transmission and perhaps international transmission improvements in Canada. Sure. I mean, I, I think the question is, on any of those studies, did they do the math and what leakage did they allow? You know, like Germany shuts off nuclear power but buys their nuclear power from France. Um, so, you know, what, have they really stopped nuclear power? Denmark has a plan for using biomass to make fuel to balance their load and run their cars and, and all that. did they really have that much biomass? It's not clear to me. The Danish uh, plan is actually very similar to this in a lot of ways, but I'm not sure they've done the math. Because the, um, so, the, so the question is, how big a region do you have to do to really make this work? And of course, the answer is the whole Earth. So you know, I think the, um, the, uh, the sense that we've, we've been somewhat careful here to be sure that we, except for the biofuel thing where we said, OK, somehow we might be able to double the amount we have by imports. And we had some justification. California is 10% of the country, so maybe we get 10% of the resources. And then if it's not that, maybe we get something from Brazil. But even so, I, I think uh, it's very difficult to know. Because uh, if you take this another step, for example, and we want to use our hydro to firm our wind power, well, maybe somebody else was counting that same hydro to do something else for them. So it's, it's really a, it's an accounting problem that just has to be done on, a, on as large a scale as, problem, as possible. Yeah. You mentioned that in order to, uh, we, we may have to double electricity and decarbonize it. So what kind of changes utilities will have to go through in order to accommodate a demand that high? Well, it's a good question because, um, you know, if, if you go uh, talk to people about how we're going to be rebuilding this electricity system, right now uh, people will say, what are you talking about? There's no new demand. We're not going to build anything. So one question is, is the idea that we're actually going to grow our economy again and grow the population at the levels that we thought we were going to do to get that estimate, is that going to be true? And I, I could tell you probably to some degree of, Accuracy that every single number I showed you has got to be wrong because it's just one number and you know a whole spectrum of things that could happen. So the estimates are crazy. 
the actual building out of the, so the answer to your question is, you have to generate the demand. And when you generate the demand, you should generate the revenue to do that. We're not doing that right now. So I think a lot of it depends on how, what happens with the economy. Not, it's, I don't think that the issues are as technical in that area as, as they are actually. If you, if you created the environment where everything new that you built was in that portfolio, in other words, you get on the escalator step by step. Same thing with cars, with buildings, with everything else. If everything new that you do, if every choice you make is in that step, you still have to have the environment where you're making those choices, where people are buying new cars, where people are buying new generation. So I think it's not just, uh, I, think, I think the problem is more in that end than it is in actually, um, you know, a, a, if they were if they're required by law not to create emissions when they do electricity in some way and you have the growth in the economy that justifies building new generation i think you can make those steps yeah. oh, you seem very skeptical about the smart grids and yeah. i have recently heard well, some enthusiastic opinion about how smart grids is going to combine the solar energy, the wind energy, and, the, and how it is going to be that people will accumulate the energy and then uh, give it back to the system. Could you please comment? Well, I'm not negative about it in the sense that I think it's, I think it's a great idea. I think we don't know how much of the problem it will solve. And I think the amount of change it represents is larger than people understand. So, all I'm, when I say, if it comes across as negative, all I'm saying is, if you're going to depend on that in order to have a high percentage of renewables in your portfolio, you shouldn't depend on it lightly. You know, you should, you should understand it a lot better, know how much it's going to do for you, know how much it's going to cost, and know what it's going to take politically and economically to make it happen. Because it's not small. And if you, if you don't solve it, you won't have reliability. If that's what you, if, that, if you're going to depend on it, you've got you to gotta make it happen. We say, uh, I'll, I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I heard a story that uh, Governor Brown said, oh, well, we've gone to 33% renewables. Maybe we should go to 50. You know, and my sense is that that is not OK. That what you have to do is really understand what it's going to do for you, how much it's going to do for you, and what it's going to take to get there. And we don't know that. Yeah, back here. How do you estimate the probability of success of nuclear fusion experiments? Especially, how do you estimate... A nuclear fusion experiments? Yes, especially maybe ITER project in France. I, I'm not a good one to ask. You could ask Dr. Ritger here. I, I, um, I don't think we're talking about getting energy from fusion in the 2050 time frame. Some people do, but I don't, I don't see that coming. Um, I don't see a lot of confidence in that. Yep, in the back. Yeah, uh, listening to the, the, the talk, I didn't get the impression that you were moving all the variables forward evenly. For instance, we talked about energy storage, uh, battery right. technology. Right, right. Um, if by 2050, that's 40 years from now, certainly, huge percentage of the vehicles will be the plug-in hybrids or electric vehicles. So now you have an entire uh, fleet of batteries that you can intermittently charge. Mm -hmm. And now your whole power curve gets shifted because instead of charging them at night, if you have solar power, you can charge them during the day or both. So it's like multiple variables should be moved forward. The other thing is in terms of biofuels, it didn't seem to accommodate the issue of uh, climate change and yeah. the potential impact of uh, a variable land. Yeah, no, we didn't. It, it, well, one, uh, on the first case, it, it's not exactly true what you said, but it, it's very spongy. So in the end, we said, look, we don't know how it'll happen, but somehow half of this load following will be solved by, will be emission free. So it would be like the batteries from the cars or, you know, or, or compressed air storage without uh, reheating requirements or, you know, just, some combination of things would work. But we actually didn't, this was, incidentally, this whole study was done for $150,000. I mean, it, it's, it's, 
we didn't have the wherewithal to delve in deeply to understand that. I think it's a really good point, and it deserves very careful study, very careful analysis. And I would just point to it and say, I hope you're right, and more studies should be done. Um, on the second one, what was the, remind me? Uh, the, uh, the issue of arable land. In terms oh, arable, of oh, yeah. Uh, climate change is, again, it was just beyond our scope, but everything. I mean, wind speeds have dropped 15% in the last 30 years. Um, the, the amount of biomass you could produce will change. The amount of water that would be available will change. The amount of electricity people want for cooling will change. I mean, the, yeah, we didn't do it. And it's another thing that deserves deserves a really close look. Yeah. Uh, the question about the calculation. Do you uh, count also the energy needed for developing a new technology which is needed for this reduction? No. Because I heard somewhere that production one windmill costs more energy than it produced during the whole lifetime of this uh, device. We were we did do some back of the envelope calculations about emissions of production of the facility and decided not to decided it wasn't significant compared to the lifetime issues. And so we 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 thought it was second order and didn't include it. Oh, there we go. In your analysis, it seems like you took the most aggressive track in each of your categories in terms of reducing emissions, or it's going to be adopted the quickest and so right. forth. Do you look at the sensitivities to whether, you know, maybe it's not adopted that quickly, and would maybe looking at the sensitivities answer your uh, concerns about the economy and its effect? No. In the analysis? Uh -uh. No, this, 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 this was a first order study. We didn't do things like that. It's, a, it's an interesting idea. Yeah. There was one way in the back, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was curious as to, I don't know if you talked about this, but the, the model that you used to be able to do it, did you use a, you know, some sort of integrated assessment model, or did you? No, it's a spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet. And it's on, if you want to look at it, it's on the web. It's on the website. It's just, a, it's just, this is not even algebra. This is addition and subtraction, multiplication. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the beauty of what this is is that it counts everything and it only counts it once and it doesn't uh, there's nothing in it, there's no integrated assessment there's no economic uh, there's nothing in here that'll tell you how uh, the economics would would go forward um, there are people that are suggesting we need to follow this up because we've identified technology portraits that would work so people want to now know, well, you know, you've, you've shown us a bunch of ways to do electricity. Which of these would actually be the economic like, best way to do it? But we haven't answered that. We were just looking at technology. Yep. Jeff. Can I just add a comment, perhaps? Uh, um, <laughs> you know, uh, having uh, contributed some of the state's yep. money towards this study, yep. um, not very much of it, but <laughs> I'd like to thank, obviously, the, the expertise that you pulled together. This is really a lot of wisdom and expertise that was gathered, yep. gathered and, and then you had to hurt these uh, cats uh, uh, for a long time. Yes. I really think this information does, goes a long way to dispelling some myths, some uh -huh. misunderstandings. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I think it'll help policymakers, at least in this state, maybe help get some policy uh, right going forward. Yep. Of course, we already think we're leaders in California as it is, but yep. I, I'd like to thank you all very much for this work. I think you'll be very good in helping to inform. Thank you. And I look to students that are here to carry it forward. <laughs> Excellent <Thanks>. ending. <laughs> I have one more question. All right. <laughs> so, so this zone, this yeah. zero emission load balancing, something I'm really interested in and I've got some people working on. But I was wondering, this load balancing, is it day, what's more, so if a student was to go out and do research, is it day night, is it interleague, is it interseason? Yes. You know, where would you focus? <laughs> well, I, I mean, the, clearly the most interesting problem is the, is the, um, uh, as Bert coined the phrase, the uh, the you know the gigawatt day mm -hmm. problem, because it, that that scale just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. 
But I think all parts of the problem are, are interesting. So I sort mean, of the intra week, the, the you've, just, yeah. you've just got three days, there's no yeah. wind, or three yeah. days, it's cloudy. And uh, I mean, I, then I think the seasonal issue might be one for various parts of the world. You know, if you tend to have a windy season and not a windy season, and you're counting on 70% wind in your renewable portfolio, you, you've got a, a long, long period of dry spell. But the, I mean, the other piece of it is what part of that triangle are you going to go after? Are you going to go after the load balancing part where you load, you know, flexible load? Mm -hmm. So this is the case where Americans are used to saying, whatever I demand, the utility will produce. Now let's change the whole paradigm to whatever I'm producing, that's all you can have. And that's, you know, what, what's the sociology of that, not to mention everything else? I think it's not just a technical Pretty problem. Pretty devastating for industry. Yeah. So anyway, we do have one time for one more quick question, if anyone has a burning question. In the back. Yeah. Yeah, on the availability of biomass question, did you consider the, the fact of significant food waste and the, that's maybe something to consider there? Uh, it, was, it was pretty much, I think, Heather Youngs did this at, at uh, Biosciences Institute of Berkeley, and I think she looked at all waste materials that she could capture for, for biofuel, including food waste. I don't, I don't think food waste is a very big chunk. But, yeah, probably so. But, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, all of those numbers are very spongy, but the... the the fact is that the factor by which we don't have enough is also very large. And so the real message is not, you know, do we have the number exactly right? The real message is it's probably not a good idea to bet on the fact that we have enough. We should work the biofuels and get as much as you can out of it. Do it right. Make sure we don't interfere with food and do it. But we should be doing something else too. That's really the message. And so whether we counted that or not, I, I'm pretty sure we did count it. If we're wrong by a bit, or some of these other estimates are wrong by a bit, still a very large factor between what we think we can produce and what we think we're going to need. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so You're much. Welcome. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.